Welcome to the Hallmark Pet Vet MRI webinar. The topic today is anesthesia of the MRI patient with Karen Church, who is speaking to us, to us all live from the UK. I shall pass the floor now to Dr. Karen Johnston, who is the Global Business Development Director, Companion Animal at Hallmark. She will present the speaker to you. Karen, the floor is all yours. And um, I also want to add my welcome to everybody that's joining. It's so much fun to type in the chat box and see that people are calling in from all over the world. So as we were saying, it's wonderful when technology works. And this is just a great way to keep in touch with everyone. So thanks again for joining. Um, so I, I did want to tell you also that for the, your friends that couldn't make it today, the webinar will also be on our website. So the first slide there shows you the Hallmark website. Um, and Charisma will email it to you, and then it will also be sitting on the website. So hopefully everybody that wants to hear it will be able to hear it at some point. So it's fun to know where everybody's calling in from, um, but we thought it might be good to know about a little bit more about who's on the line. So the first thing I want to do is just um, ask you a couple of questions. And the first one is just knowing whether we have mostly veterinarians or mostly technicians on the line. So there's just a quick polling question, and all you need to do is hit the button to say whether you're a nurse, a technician, or a veterinarian. Okay, so it's, it looks like we're, it's mostly nurses and technicians, so that makes sense, um, since Karen, our speaker, is a nurse as well. And the other thing that we we're just wondering about is um, whether you have a lot of experience using an MRI with small animal, with equine, or is it something you aspire to do, um, or whether you're just interested in the topic. So do you currently use MRI? Um, are you hoping to use it, or are you just interested in the topic? This will help Karen know who she's speaking to. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so now I can introduce Karen Church. Um, Karen is the head neurology nurse at Southern County's Veterinary Specialist. It's a very large, multidiscipline, small animal referral hospital in England. And she spends most of her day in the MRI suite with dogs and cats. So she's really the perfect person to give this lecture. And I know you're going to learn a whole lot from her. She's going to give you some great tips. She's actually a really uniquely qualified vet nurse to give this talk. As she's an AIMVT nurse. This, many of you probably know, stands for the Academy of Internal Medicine for Veterinary Technicians. And I know this took a lot of work for Karen, um, a very hard exam during ACVIM a couple of conferences ago. But she's now recognized as a veterinary technician specialist in neurology. And it's something really to be proud of because she's the first um, nurse slash technician in the UK to get this degree. So well done, Karen, on that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over for you to give your presentation. Um, as Charisma said, if you have questions, please um, type them into the chat box and we'll collect those. And then at the end, we'll do 10 minutes or so of a, a Q&A. Oh, and I see, Samantha, you're an MRI tech, so you answered my question earlier. Thank you for chatting in the chat box with us. Okay, Karen, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. That's a, a lovely introduction. Um, and I shall begin my talk on anesthesia in the MRI. Um, so obviously, uh, you know that I'm a head neuro nurse at Southern Counties, um, which means that my role is to support the neurologists uh, with their diagnostics and treatment of the neuro patients. So on a daily basis, uh, these patients will um, require advanced imaging, and obviously one such being MRI. Um, so hence, I'm going to talk to you today about um, how we go about anesthetizing our patients for the MRI. Uh, hopefully, um, during the discussion, um, I'll be able to give you some tips on um, anesthesia, and a lot of it will be unique to the Hallmark MRI system. Uh, so let's begin. So as uh, a lot of you look like you um, are involved with MRI, um, so you'll be aware that due to the length of time uh, required to complete a scan uh, within the MR uh, suite uh, and the sensitivity to motion. Uh, this means that the safest and sort of um, most uh, effective way to have our patients scanned is to have them anesthetized um, under a full general anesthetic. Um, really because this means uh, we can provide the, the most safest form of immobilization 
um, much preferred over sedation as it's far more predictable and we're able to control it better. Um, and obviously, we're able to monitor them um, with much greater um, efficiency. Now, something which um, is not very common, and that is uh, staff training. Really, I, I'm, I think I'm right in saying within America as well, but definitely in the UK, uh, there's no formal training within our um, veterinary technician or veterinary nurse training. Um, so we often have to rely on um, other members of staff who are uh, more proficient and experienced within the MRI suite to provide um, and pass on information, certainly regarding the safety aspects of MR. Obviously, we're working in an area with a, a high magnetic field, um, so strong magnetic field, sorry, should I say. Uh, and this obviously um, carries inherent risks that we should be aware of with regards to our, per, our own personal safety and our patient safety. And then obviously we're dealing with anesthesia, so um, we need to have anesthesia training. Obviously we can draw upon our experiences with anesthetizing patients um, in other diagnostics, for instance CT, and obviously during uh, surgeries we'll anesthetize patients. So we can really draw on our, um, our expertise from those um, and carry them through to MRI. Um, I'll be talking later, obviously, um, with regards to monitoring these patients. Uh, we lose a lot of the ability to do our hands-on examination, so we really have to get used to how we how we monitor anaesthetics using various pieces of equipment and um, reading things like heart rate and rest rate, um, and really doing everything from a, a distance rather than touching our patients. Um, so. That's something we have to consider. And then, obviously, um, we can do extra research uh, si sitting and listening to CPD like this or reading articles and books on the subject. Although it's very limited, there is, uh, there's often short paragraphs within um, MRI books that refer to the anaesthetic side of um, dealing with these patients. Um, I'm just going to ask a quick question to you. Um, so, if you're a veterinary nurse or veterinary technician, uh, which statement best describes your use of MRI? So we have, I conduct most or all of our scans and consider myself to be an expert in using the technology. I conduct most or all of our scans and consider myself to still be learning how to get the best out of the technology. Or I conduct routine scans but don't consider myself an expert. I am involved in patient care, prep for MRI, but I don't run any scans myself. And then our, pe our practice doesn't have an MRI, and I'm not involved in this area. So the answers will be uh, one or two veterinary nurses or technicians specialising in the technology. Anyone should be able to use it, and all vets and vet nurses should be trained, or should be operated by veterinarians. Next question, in how many cases does the clinician or veterinary specialist get involved in the process of scanning other than to request what structure they want to view? So less than 10% of cases, 10 to 25% of cases, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75% of cases, or 76 to 100% of cases. Okay, so we finished our poll. Um, back to the talk. Uh, so the neurological patient. Um, I'll obviously focus and draw on my experiences of anesthetizing patients with neurological pathology uh, whilst discussing um, MRI anesthesia, as this is uh, the patient which will most commonly uh, be using MRI for. Uh, really, because the MRI is probably the best. Uh, 
advanced diagnostic imaging for, um, for obtaining images of the brain and the spinal cord and peripheral nerve disorders. The intracranial pathology it's good for, spinal peripheral nerve disorders. So as I said, it's, uh, it's far more sensitive of the soft tissue structures than CT, for instance. Um, and we can identify brain pathology or lesions within the spinal cord parenchyma with much greater detail. So as I was saying, patient preparation. After the neurologist has uh, made assessments of their patient and requested MRI, and that we know that we need to prepare them for their general anesthetic, um, we need to stabilize them, um, which will involve extracranial stabilization. As I said, uh, this may require taking a blood panel and checking their renal and hepatic function, and by doing hands-on checks, so auscultation of the heart and lungs, to check for that the cardiovascular and respiratory system and their status uh, we consider stable enough for an anesthetic. Um, this is also an opportunity to um, make sure that there are no um, implants with the patient that might be um, either non-compatible with the MRI. So for instance, if the patient has a cardiac pacemaker, then that will, be, um, will mean that they won't be able to enter the MRI. Whereas if it's an orthopedic implant, then usually the, the next generation, um, more, the more frequently used implants nowadays are um, MRI compatible. Um, and obviously, so long as the surgery um, for those things hasn't been re recent, because there can be a risk that these will um, heat up within the MRI bore. So these are all the opportunities that we can take to make sure that our patient is safe to enter the MRI suite. Once we've done that, then we can gain IV access. As you see, my little Daxi here is uh, awaiting his MRI, and he has an uh, IV uh, catheter in place. Uh, as everyone will be aware, that will mean we can give medications, uh, which will include a pre-medication um, and fluid therapy if we need to stabilize them um, and make sure they're hydrated. And this also means um, we are ready for induction. So pre-medications, why do we use these? Um, in, when you go to read my article, I will have um, written uh, a little bit about various drugs. Um, we'll go into some detail, but I won't go on too much about those. There will be extra reading within the article that's provided. Um, but obviously, we need to um, use a pre-medication, as this will help us relieve any anxiety within our patient and hopefully promote a calm patient which will mean much easier handling and therefore the induction will be smooth for the patient and ourselves. Now ideally the medications that we use within our pre-med uh, should be able to reduce fear and anxiety, uh, be easily administered and have hopefully a quick or reasonable onset and duration. Some of the drugs that we use can be antagonizable, so we can reverse those drugs if they have an undesired, desirable effect. And um, we want to really know that dose dependent, we can predict how they are going to affect our patient. We also want to hopefully pr produce a minimal side effect. Um, sadly, no one drug will do this. Um, so often, using a combination of these drugs, um, are often at lower doses, certainly for our patients with a neurological dysfunction, will still help us uh, achieve what we need to with, the, with our pre-meds. Um, as I say, so a smooth induction and hopefully a smooth recovery, but that's dependent on the duration of the drug and, and whether we can repeat those if necessary. And then obviously this uh, use of pre-medication will mean that we can reduce our doses of induction agents and then our maintenance um, anesthesia, so our inhalation gases often. Um, so really it means that by using a multimodal effect, we can uh, reduce the drugs so their side effects will be reduced 
again, something important to remember when we're dealing with neurological patients because they're often very debilitated. So as I've been talking about the neuro patients, we can split them into intracranial patients and spinal patients. Those are usually the categories that we're dealing with. Um, there are a few considerations uh, to, to be aware of when we're dealing with these guys. So we really want to try and give um, drugs that have minimal side effects and minimal effects on the cerebral perfusion pressure and uh, the intracranial pressure. These guys will often have a raised intracranial pressure, um, so we really don't want to exasperate that. Um, ACP is a sedative, I might mention, that is often very useful. Um, however, with our intracranial patients, um, of the, uh, the neurologists um, often feel that it's better to avoid these drugs um, and also dexmedetotamine, again, a very useful sedative, a very potent sedative. Um, the side effects are sometimes undesirable, so um, we possibly will avoid these. I mean, in some instances, there might be reason to give these at low doses, but we do need to be fully aware of their side effects. So ACP uh, will cause quite profuse hypertension, and that's something that we um, we don't want to um, create in our intracranial patients because of um, brain perfusion. We um, we really want to avoid that. And then with the dexmedetonamine, again, a very useful sedative. Uh, it can cause hypo hyperglycemia. Sorry, uh, something which is can already be uh, an, a a problem within patients with uh, intracranial pressure, raising intracranial pressure. Also, uh, it has quite a profound respiratory depression. Again, this is something that we want to avoid with our patients with brain pathology. Um, we'll often use uh, an opioid with our patients. Um, if they're deemed painful enough, if it's sort of a traumatic injury, um, we would go for an opioid. Um, we're lucky enough, I'm not entirely sure if it's available widespread in the US, but methadone, um, certainly at low doses. Um, and sometimes with cats, buprenorphine is quite effective too, although it's got a bit of a longer um, time for um, action. Um, with a, Methadone is pretty good. It starts to work IV after about five minutes, whereas buprenorphine takes a little bit longer, up to half an hour. And the other opioid is the of the morphine, uh, but the side effect of this is emesis, and we really don't want our patients with brain um, pathology um, with increased or risk of increased intracranial pressure to have um, sickness because that inevitably can increase the intracranial pressure as well. And then our other group of patients, the spinal patients. Um, Pre-medication and anesthesia designed for um, our brain patients can often be transferred to the spinal patients because we really want to maintain perfusion within that spinal cord. Um, if, it's her, if the patient has a neurological injury um, that's causing problems with the spinal cord, so either um, traumatic or there's compression from a disc, then we really want to have that in mind that perfusion of that spinal cord is paramount. So again, the use of um, ACP and causing hypertension, then um, that's something we want to avoid. Um, so maybe using reduced doses of these drugs if our patients um, are anxious. Um, they could be an anxious due to the, the, the um, inability to walk if they've got a spinal cord injury um, or just due to pain. So a combination of a sedative and a good pain relief is, is very useful. The other thing to consider is our um, mechanical instability. So before we've imaged these patients, that we, we really need to be very mindful that if they've had an injury either to the spinal cord, either from an intervertebral disc compression or worse, um, more traumatic, perhaps we're dealing with 
a fracture, then we need to be mindful that if we give heavy sedatives, then they may lose their um, the stability, but the muscle, um, paraspinal muscles, might maybe uh, relax too much to the point where they they don't have that stability. So um, we need to remember that when we're giving drugs, and obviously when we're moving the patients as well, once they're sedated or once they're anesthetized, that we maintain uh, that stability. So moving patients and making sure their their backs are straight, and we're providing that support mechanically. And obviously, patients with neck lesions, so cervical lesions, we need to be mindful that this can cause respiratory insufficiency. So considering the drugs that we use, so we um, don't exasperate that further. And once we have anesthetized these patients, we potentially may need to support this either by mechanically ventilating them or intermittently providing IPPV, so intermittent positive pressure ventilation. So we need to be mindful of these things in case we need to give extra support. So moving on to preparation of our induction. Um, I've always uh, used this uh, little motto that um, the five P's, so proper preparation prevents poor performance. So it's really important that we uh, minimize the time of the patient's anesthesia. Um, we all know that MRI takes a considerable amount of time. The imaging, uh, obtaining the images can take a, an, um, you know, up to an hour, maybe beyond if we're imaging a large area. And with debilitated patients, this can increase our risk. So if we have everything ready, before our patient comes for its induction, then um, this can reduce our, t our time. Um, greatly. So this is just a quick picture of one of our um, induction tables with some equipment ready. Um, so as you see, I'll just drag my pointer. Doesn't seem to want to work right now. Um, here we go. So um, we have here obviously the rinderscope and some lube for the ET tubes. ET tubes aren't um, in this photo, but we obviously need those for the patient and. IV fluid therapy and if you notice we have an extension line for our IV fluids because we have quite a distance to go from the, um, the safe zone within the MRI to use an um, IV pump. Um, we need to be able to reach the patient once it's in the uh, bore of the MRI. We also need to have um, uh, access to their IV so an injection port needs to be accessible outside of the MRI scanner. Now we're told Mark there is a door that has to be shut for the patient to go inside and being able to have an extra long IV line means that we can access that quickly. Um, we also have various things that will keep the patients warm. We've got some bubble wrap for their feet and a blanket and a uh, bear hugger blanket, so warm air circulating blanket. And then each patient will have an induction tray, which I'll go through what's in there in a minute. Because um, I think that's everything covered for that page. And then we'll move on to the induction tray. I think my computer's taking a little while to move on. Here we go. So within this induction tray, we have everything that oh, gone too far. Sorry about that. So we have um, liquid tears. We will place that in all our patients at induction. Uh, we really want to pr protect their eyes from any any um, drying, uh, as we may uh, give those patients ulcers uh, and keratitis. So liquid tears is, is a really valuable tool, um, bit of uh, equipment. Well, not really equipment, sorry. Um, very valuable to provide to the patient at induction because we probably don't get access to them um, after the MRI scan starts. And so that will hopefully keep those eyes protected for the hour or so in MRI. If they're brachiospallic patients, then we'll often uh, use a bit of micropore, just some paper tape to tape those shut after we've lubricated those, again, um, to 
to make sure that we don't cause any drying of those eyes. Um, Earplugs, which I'll talk about later. Um, thermometer covers, just to remind us that we need to take the temperature. We don't have uh, temperature monitoring with an MRI, so pre and post MRI, so we know our patient's temperatures. And then obviously an esophageal stethoscope end. Uh, this is a great tool. Uh, it's a very crude method of auscultating the heart, but I find it invaluable if you have problems with your MRI monitoring and all the high-tech equipment. Um, in between scans, uh, when the sequences aren't running, we can listen to the patient's heart without entering the MRI room or, or the MRI monitor um, itself. ECG pads. We have a four-lead ECG, and these are ECG pads that have non-ferromagnetic uh, material on them. Um, and also, we place a vest over the top. So these are really sticky if you stick them to your cells, but the patients, we have to clip their chest um, and stick those on. Uh, sometimes it, we're lucky enough they'll stick, and sometimes we're not. So the vest just helps to keep those strapped down, and then obviously movement from the patient moving from the induction area to the MRI, we can often lose those. So it just means that we have those and hopefully keep them stuck down and don't have problems obtaining an ECG. And moving on to our induction table, as um, we have our um, circuit set up here ready for our patients, and we have our um, vital signs monitor, then we have our equipment to try and maintain our patient's body temperature. So we've got our uh, warm air blanket. We also have an IV fluid warmer just to try and warm those fluids up whilst they're going through to our patient. And we also have a heated circuit here. Um, just to remember that's not compatible with MRI, so that is only used during the induction phase and preparation. We also have over in the corner a suction machine. This is just in case we have any problems that patients may um, regurg uh, under anesthetic, that we can um, sort that out quickly and provide suction if needed. Hopefully most of the time we don't need to use that, but it is there on standby um, just in case. Um, and then before our induction starts, uh, we will read through our anesthesia safety checklist. Um, this one is specific to MRI, which I created. Um, it's an adaptation of the surgical safety checklist that some of you may be familiar with uh, that were created by the, um, the, anest uh, the anesthesia um, group. This ensures everything that we um, need has been checked prior to induction. If you see, um, this is quite specific to our, our center, but we need to check that the clinician in charge of the case is aware and the radiologist is aware also that they will be available for the MRI scan because they run our scans at Southern Counties. Um, and this is specific to if we're dealing with a patient at risk to raised intracranial pressure. So just to check that we are aware that we might need to use the mechanical ventilator and that setup ready, and whether we need manacle on standby and whether that's set up. And then if we've decided that it's um, indicated that we might need to place an arterial catheter, then obviously the um, earplugs and the uh, softer tube, making sure that's been placed, and any drugs that may be needed um, perioperatively. So, um, Again, our brachycephalic patients, they're quite at risk of regurg under anesthetic, so we may need to give them gastric protectant. So just so that everyone's clear on what we should be doing at induction. Then following induction, and um, oh, I did really mention, I've forgotten, that in big red letters at the very top of the checklist is a, an important reminder regarding uh, metal. So any collars that are present on our patient, they, we have an area that we can check that we've definitely removed those, and that can be circled once that's done. And then once we're in the MRI scanning room, we can um, just do another uh, 
check this where we will just say out loud who our patient is and to make sure we know which area that we're scanning of our patient. Um, and then again, specific to Southern Counties, we have a post MRI checklist. This is for making sure that all samples that are obtained um, after the MRI um, can be uh, can be obtained and check that they are taken to the uh, relevant labs, etc. Just to make sure that everything's been done for the patient. Then at the end of the scan, making sure that we remove the earplugs and we know our recovery plan. So I've just provided a couple of photos of our patient being um, induced for anesthesia here. Um, this patient is actually being pre-oxygenated. This is something that we do with our patients that we may have um, difficulty intubating or if they're intracranial patients, providing extra oxygen. Um, the, the, the goal for this is really to in, increase the percentage of oxygen um, that is um, functional, um, so the functional residual capacity. Um, so if we increase the oxygen concentration, um, I think about five minutes of flow by oxygen can really increase that to give you enough time to intubate the patient without causing hypoxia. So that's something very um, useful and important to, as I say, certainly with our intracranial patients. And then this is our patient here with their induction drug ready to go and the laryngoscope. And then a photo here of a patient that's had an, um, an arterial catheter placed. And that will be labeled so that everyone knows uh, that that is for arterial blood pressures only. And I've just provided a video just to show quickly that um, my colleagues uh, inducing this little chihuahua. And just once, once they've induced the patient, seeing how they move their patient into the MRI. So that's two hours. Um, an easy patient to maneuver into the MRI scan area. And you can see they're placing them on the MRI bed. And this little two hours having a brain scan. So there's a brain head coil there. And they're being attached to the anesthetic. And then I think that finishes. I'm about to move into the MRI for. On the right-hand side here is the Doberman that's been uh, induced ready for MRI. You can see the um, ECG pads are placed on the chest. And this is because we have quite short leads for the ECG. Um, MRI-specific ECG monitoring leads have to be quite short, and they are um, they're specific for MRI so that they don't have any sort of metallic magnet, um, sorry, <clears throat> the short lead so that they can actually pick up an ECG without too much interference from the MRI. So that's why they have uh, their positioned on the chest as opposed to on the feet that you can often use um, ECG leads with. And you see also the patient has an arterial catheter place. This guy actually had a scan of his uh, cervical uh, neck. He's a wobbler's patient, so um, post-surgery, um, post-MRI, sorry, he went to surgery, so it's very useful to be able to monitor blood pressure accurately for uh, quite a length. Of, the dog had quite a long anesthesia. Now, this image is um, of the Hallmark MRI table. Um, it's really useful. This table can be moved away out of the MRI scanner. Um, it can be unhooked from the um, MRI ball, which means we can push the trolley into our prep area and we can move our very large patients onto this table and um, be able to maneuver them into the MRI uh, suite itself without having to carry large dogs. As you'd be aware that um, a lot of trolleys that you can use to maneuver patients will be uh, metal and they'll be uh, dangerous to use within the MRI field. Um, and so this is a great way of moving the really heavy patients 
and also, as I said earlier, about maintaining stability if it was a patient with a spinal cord um, pathology, then we can maneuver them by uh, sidling our induction table up and leveling them off and be able to lift them um, w with a couple of people safely without causing too much problem. There's a massive in here that's having a brain scan. So I mentioned earlier that we use earplugs. There are different types of earplugs that you can use. This uh, guy is wearing um, earmuffs. They're quite large, so we can't really use this type because of the size of the head coils that we use for MRI. Uh, it means that they would have to be in a much bigger head coil, and that could compromise our imaging. So we tend to go for in-ear plugs. So laser light are the type of plugs that we use. These are really handy ones because they have a cord attached to both of them, so we can easily spot if they're in the patient's um, ears. And, and it means for removing them again, it's a bit of an indicator. We don't want to leave those in um, too long after their recovery of anesthesia. Sometimes it might help for noise levels in the kennels, but we definitely want to make sure we've got rid of them after. Um, the reason we need to use the earplugs is obviously the, the high noise levels within the MRI um, ball. We try to aim for our plane of anesthesia to be relatively light because we just really want to achieve uh, our patients to be immobilized. And so um, the level of anesthesia doesn't necessarily have to be as deep as, say, for instance, surgery. But the noise level within the MRI scanner can often um, cause the patients to react. The, the, the sound level is recorded at more than 100 decibels within the MRI. There was a study done by, I think, the surname is et al, um, that had um, done some studies into human MRI and um, discovered that there could be some cochlear dysfunction caused after being in the scanner for um, an hour plus with this sort of noise level. Uh, provided along the side here, just a, a, an idea of how noisy that really is. So more than 100 decibels, we're talking about sitting next to a, a leaf blower um, or an ambulance. Um, that could get quite um, distracting or very annoying um, after a considerable amount of time. So this helps us with our anesthesia. And um, by plugging their ears, hopefully that won't cause too much uh, upset whilst they're under anesthetic for their scan. Then moving on to our anesthetic equipment. When you're um, monitoring anesthesia within an MRI, it's really, really useful to have um, a monitor that is MRI compatible uh, because this means that you are able to use a pulse oximetry and ECG because they use uh, leads that have metal and then they can obviously be um, a danger to your patient when they heat up. The MRI compatible ones uh, are, won't won't be won't be doing that. So this is a great thing to have. Um, you can still monitor anaesthetic with a non-compatible machine, but it means you won't be able to use pulse oximetry or ECG. Um, the capnography you could use. You just need to make sure that the actual monitor is in your control room and the leads come through the hole in the wall. And the hole in the wall is the, where we use our esophageal lines long piece of piping so we can hear the patient's heart um, and blood pressure, non-invasive blood pressure cuffs often don't have anything ferromagnetic so that again could be used to pass through the uh, hole in the wall. But we're very lucky that we can use multi-modal um, mon monitoring. And then the anesthetic trolley, this is an MRI compatible anesthetic trolley. Again, being able to use this close to the MRI bore means that we don't have to use such long uh, anesthetic tubing. Uh, it still has to be of a length, so it's at a safe distance. Um, but I say reducing that drastically, because if that was going through the hole in the wall, it would have to be much longer. Um, 
we tend to use um, a circle for our larger patients, and we also have a Humphrey ADE. I don't know if anyone's familiar with using this, but I find it useful because we keep all our equipment in the MRI scan room. So this is bolted onto the anesthetic trolley, and it can be quickly transferred um, and modified depending on the, the size of your patient. So you can use it in the, um, a Bain or a, or a McGill style um, without the absorbent canister for the smaller patients. And then for the larger patients, you can have it as a circle. It also has the ability to IPTV your patient um, for a long period because of the, um, the APL valve. And also, there's a lever on it, so you can transfer very quickly from um, IPTV or, or um, normal ventilation, spontaneous ventilation, and by switching it down, you can have it in the mechanical mode so that you can then use a mechanical ventilator, which is, uh, again, something that is MRI compatible so that's safe to go in to the room, to the MRI room. Um, I try and keep all the equipment in here that is... Um, is safe and usable so that we don't have to, um, personnel don't have to bring things into the room. So that kind of hopefully reduces the risk of someone taking something into the room that isn't safe to be used within the MRI room. And you can also see the IV fluid line here. It's extra long, goes all the way to the patient, and there's an IV port there, which you can use for either administering other drugs or um, contrast agents. I think the next slide will be a video just showing how we get our patients inside the MRI scanner. So here we see placing the patient into the scanner. Um, the lines here are the anesthetic circuit that can be clipped in, and then the monitoring line, the BP uh, line and capnography, etc. And then the hatch goes down. Now, you might think that this is a bit of a problem with, in terms of monitoring your patients. Now, obviously, you can't monitor your patient hands-on, um, but with the design of the Hallmark MRI, with the hatch itself shielding, so it means that we can enter the room during the scan without causing too much interference, and it means we can adjust our anesthetic um, inhalation gas and, and oxygen, etc. from there. Um, as you see in the, the still, uh, you can see one of our nurses uh, being able to monitor from the distance with um, in vivo remote portion. In the in vivo is the name of the monitor that we use. This is just a slide of inside the control room where we've got the remote portion. We can see um, the ECG and the capnography tray. And then we also have our um, monitor screen here. Uh, we've got some cameras that we can monitor the patient from a distance. And we also have a tray uh, box sorry, here in the bottom left corner. This is our um, emergency crash drug, so we have them close to hand uh, should we need those. Hopefully we don't need those too often. So moving on, what should we be monitoring? In terms of anesthesia, there's not really any different from um, um, providing anesthesia in any other circumstance. We, uh, we can monitor our central nervous system, our cardiovascular system, respiratory system, our temperature, neuromuscular system, and renal function. Now, our central nervous system, monitoring this, some of these uh, are removed from our ability once we place our patient in MRI. So uh, our palpebral reflex, our corneal reflex, and gag reflex, these, um, and jaw tone, obviously, we can't do our hands-on monitoring because our patient is now in the MRI scanner and, and closed off to us. So we really have to rely on our monitoring system and being able to really make decisions on our heart rate and blood pressure and respiratory rate. So for the cardiovascular system, we have the ability to oscillate um, our heart, 
a patient's heart by means of the esophageal uh, stethoscope. Um, as I said earlier, it's a very crude method, but it really is useful between scans. Obviously, you have to be careful during the scans. The radio frequencies are very loud, so you don't want to be uh, risking your own hearing by um, trying to listen in on that whilst the scans are going. And if you're lucky enough to have an ECG, we can monitor our, our, um, our heart rate and um, by our ECG. As I say, um, hands-on monitoring of our patient is really lost during the MRI scan, so palpation of pulses is something that we can't do. But if we have pulse oximetry, we are able to monitor our pulse rate and our uh, oxygen saturation via this. Doppler flow probes uh, aren't MRI compatible, so again, we won't be able to use those within our MRI unit. But if we want to place an arterial line, then we can have central uh, venous pressure with those, and, and we also have non-invasive blood pressure with the uh, blood pressure cuff, the oscillometric version. So there are ways that we can monitor our cardiovascular system quite well within the MRI. And monitoring our respiratory system, so we can monitor our patient's breathing rate and rhythm and tidal volume and depth of each breath, really by watching, either by watching through the window or being in the MI um, suite and checking our reservoir bag. The esophageal stethoscope, again, will be able to hear our patient's respirate, and then uh, really our greatest tool is the capnography, really for generally uh, monitoring an anesthetic. This is a great tool to have. Um, we can obviously measure our patient's respirate by this, and also their end tidal CO2 will give us an indication of how uh, deep their anesthetic is or how light. And then if we're talking in terms of our intracranial patients, we really want to be monitoring that this is as normal capnic as possible, um, really so that we're not exasperating any raised intracranial pressure. Um, if our patient has hypercapnia, so its respirate is very low and its CO2 is rising, then this can obviously worsen our, our, our cerebral um, perfusion um, and increase our intracranial pressure. And then observation of our patient, although we can't do hands-on monitoring, we have good access to be able to view our patient. So view, viewing through one of the windows within the MRI, um, we'll be able to watch our patient's chest wall moving. Um, and as I said previously, watching the reservoir bag will help us with all of these things in terms of checking the patient's respirate and rhythm. Now, um, Hallmark have cameras within their MRI, so this is very useful, as I say, to be able to either look through the window or from the monitoring room, from the MRI uh, control room, we'll be able to see this on our camera. So this is a patient in dorsal recumbency, and we can see their back feet, um, hind legs sticking out here, and there's a blanket covering the patient, and we'll be able to watch the, the chest wall movement there. Then the Front camera, the patient is quite far in, um, in this view, but we can see the um, anesthetic tubing feeding to the ZT tube here, um, and then we'll be able to monitor um, his head and um, check that things like our pulse oximeter is still attached. If, if we feel that there's a problem with that, we've got good view there. There's something to consider within the MRI. Uh, is temperature. Now, we all understand that uh, anesthetizing our patients, um, they're unable to thermoregulate, so we can often get hypothermia uh, with our patients. So during our induction phase um, in the preparation room, we're using all the bits of equipment that we can't use necessarily in the MRI to try and keep their temperatures up. So the heated air blanket, and with the really small patients, we'd also place things like the um, little death um, fleece jackets are often useful. And, then, and as I said earlier, using the 
the bubble wrap on their feet to try and insulate them. I noticed someone mentioned earlier they use baby socks. That's a great one too. I've used those in the past. Um, and finding them in the washing though um, in our practice can sometimes be difficult. They, they tend to go missing. Um, obviously the reason for keeping the patient's temperature as normal thermic as possible is to really uh, counteract these um, side effects. So the metabolic rate decreasing, the blood viscosity and hypercoagulability of the blood. Not, um, obviously they're not having, well, some patients may be having surgery post MRI, so these are things that we want to really kind of counteract. Um, and it's something to be aware of, reducing the MAC of your anesthetic. So if the patient's in there for a while and we're not maintaining their temperature, um, then this is something to consider that we maybe have to reduce our inhalation gas. And then I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the HMEs. These are heat and moisture exchangers. We use these on our patients uh, at the very start of our anesthetic. They take about 20 minutes to really sort of kick in and, and start working. And they will um, draw the heat from the patient's exhaled air and moisture and pass that back to the patient. Particularly useful with our small patients because they're often on non-rebreathing circuits and they can be delivering quite cold air. So again, something we can use still in the MRI because there's no components within this that uh, are not MRI compatible. They're, they're all plastic, so they're good to go. And um, if you noticed earlier in our induction area, we use a Deval warm um, air circuit. This is something we can't take into MRI, so it's clearly labeled with warnings in case people think that that is useful within the MRI uh, scanning area. Um, this provides um, a heated filament to the inside limb of our um, anesthetic circuit by a copper wire, I think, is, it, is within that. Uh, something that really shouldn't be used within MRI because this will cause a lot of artifacts with your MRI, um, and it's it's a risk to use these. So unfortunately, only able to use that at induction and then post MRI. So as soon as we've got the patient scanned, then we'll bring them back to this prep area and, and put them back on the circuit so that we can try and make, keep them warm if they've got too cold. There's something to mention that in literature for human MRIs, they often mention that patients can actually have heat transfer from the radio frequencies within an MRI ball. Um, we don't tend to find that. I don't know whether it's because our patients are much smaller and we're obviously always having to use anesthesia, which contributes to causing hypothermia. Um, but we have ne never really tend to notice that the MRI is causing any heat transfer. So we really do um, put it on our list of things to kind of c combat, and that's heat loss. Um, just going to compare really large patients with really small patients. Um, they obviously carry inherent complications between, um, both unique to the small patient and the large patient. As I just said about the MRI, um, being able to heat up the, um, the body of the patient within the MRI scanner, um, we really don't find that. But the larger patients, sometimes we will find that they're quite warm on induction. and Certainly my experience has been about you guys, but large breed dogs like the German Shepherd and Husky, um, and Malamute, that kind of dog, we find that if they have quite an, a high end normal temperature uh, induction, we might not be so proactive in putting all those heating, um, so blankets, um, fleece jackets and bubble wrap on them. And certainly because they're under anesthetic for a while, uh, often using the circle, which maintains a lot of heat. We often find that they won't lose a lot of heat in the MRI and sometimes even come out a bit warmer than they did. Maybe that has something to do with the MRI scanner, but I think usually it's the things that I've listed um, there. I don't know if you guys have any experience with those um, breed dogs coming out of the scanner just as warm as they went in. Um, so here's my table, just um, a few things to think about with the degree, varying degrees sizes of patients. So the small patients, um, as we went through hypothermia, um, monitor failure, that's often an issue with, certainly with 
MRI'd cats before and, and very young kittens, in fact. The SPO2 probe used with uh, the in vivo that we use, the MRI compatible monitor, they are specific to humans, so no one's come up with making a monitor for pet animals yet. And the probes are designed for people's fingers. They're often quite large and quite cumbersome or misshapen. So placing those on the cat's tongues is often difficult to maintain for that length of time. Um, if you do manage to get a good coupling of that. Um, in the past, I've clipped their tails and um, used the, um, the skin of the base of their tail to try and get a pulse ox. Um, and the ECG pads, again, we tried everything we can to keep maintain those um, sticking. And then large breed dogs, moving them into the MRI suite, that hallmark table is really useful for managing that um, without too much problem. But quick removal of the patient can sometimes be difficult. I mean, if you have a problem with intubation and you need to reintubate them, you will either have to do that blind or remove the patient so that you can use something like a laryngoscope. Um, there are MRI compatible laryngoscopes, but they're quite pricey, so it's whether you can afford to purchase one of those. And then alternatively, with the small patients, accidental extubation is probably far more common. Um, moving small patients, you have to be really in tune with each other when you're positioning them, that someone is protecting the ET tube. Um, they're tied in, so that does help, but sometimes this has uh, been an, uh, a problem. Again, certainly with the cats and the small kittens, and even sometimes the small breed dogs. And that's my last slide. So really, in, in conclusion, um, really proficient training and knowledge within the, um, um, the MRI um, and having a familiarity with how to run an anesthetic within the MRI um, is really paramount. Uh, people need to be familiar and aware of the safety um, implications and, and potential hazards. And as I said, planning um, is, is really important for your patients. They're often neuro patients and they're quite compromised. So reducing as much as you possibly can their anesthetic time is really, um, really best for, for, the, for that patient. So planning and preparation, I think, is key. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I hope everyone's enjoyed that. And if anyone's got any questions, um, feel free to type them, and I'll do my best to answer those. Karen, thank you so much. It was an absolutely fantastic lecture. And thank you, everybody, for persevering with us. And Thank you. <laughs> yes, I'll just, um, just repeat what you said to say, Karen Church, thank you so much. Wonderful talk. I know that when you talked about put it, losing the baby socks in the laundry, everybody could relate to that. <laughs> and um, certainly they loved your checklist. So I think that if I'm not mistaken, your checklist is in the paper that you wrote for this webinar, and um, that's already on the Hallmark website, so people can get your checklist. Was this topic something that was helpful um, to you or not? We'd like to know on that last polling question. Thank you for answering. And also, if you wouldn't mind just typing in any other topics that you think would be useful, and we'd be very happy to do, um, to do another webinar again. Um, answering some of the questions that you have about MRI. So with that, um, Karen Church, thank you once again, and I think we're ready to sign off. So thanks everybody for your time.